and Earth and Planetary Sciences. Uh, uh, Dr. Griffin got her degree from Scripps Oceanographic Institute in San Diego and is an assistant professor right now at UC Davis. Uh, if you allow me to check my notes here. Uh, uh, Dr. Griffin is a, uh, uh, is a marine biogeochemist researching carbon cycling in the coastal ecosystems and working uh, towards a more just, equitable, and inclusive earth science community. So it does a lot of different work in um, it's obviously an enthusiast uh, scuba diver, uh, and uh, so we're anxious to hear all about uh, the green sediments and uh, related to climate change. So with that, I will give you Dr. Griffin. Yeah. Well, thank you everybody for coming and skipping out on your paleo work. <laughs> um, it's really great to be here with you all, and thanks for uh, allowing me to come talk to you about uh, my research program, which is really at the nexus of the global carbon cycle, marine sediments, and future, future and past climate change. So um, I'm a marine biogeochemist. Uh, that was not a lie. Uh, and just like the name suggests, uh, marine biogeochemistry really uses uh, three branches to better understand marine ecosystems. So, uh, biological, geological, and chemical processes that interact with one another uh, and impact both local and global elemental cycles. Um, why the ocean? Well, I have two geology degrees. I am a rock hammer carrying geologist by training, but uh, I moved into the ocean environment because the ocean makes up 71% uh, of the surface of our planet and it's integral to the Earth system as well as to our climate. Um, but like many biogeochemical systems, uh, the uh, marine environment is being perturbated by different anthropogenic activities, and the one uh, that we're most familiar with, I'm sure, is the global carbon cycle. So raise your hand if you've seen this before. Okay, cool. <laughs> so um, I think they like, you know, revoke your your scripts card if you don't show this in your talks, but uh, essentially uh, this is a graph showing uh, atmospheric CO2 measurements beginning in 1958 through present day um, uh, with uh, CO2 concentrations on the y-axis. And these measurements were first started by Dr. David Keeling, and so it is known as the Keeling curve. And what it shows is that we have this uh, rapidly increasing amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, which of course uh, is leading to changes in our global climate. So when I first thought about uh, climate, I was actually a music major uh, who took a geology class because I heard it was easy and we got to go on field trips. <laughs> um, but joking aside, I absolutely fell in love with geology. Um, I was just really fascinated by the scale of planetary processes and geologic time and how we as humans uh, seemingly insignificant could impact something as large uh, as the global carbon system. So why marine sediments? So hopefully I can, you know, convince some of you to come over to the dark side of oceanography. But um, I decided to study marine sediments because marine sedimentation is a fundamental control of ocean chemistry, atmospheric CO2, and in turn Earth's climate. So marine sediments are kind of the end of the line when we think about the carbon cycle. So carbon enters the ocean and then uh, eventually uh, settles into uh, marine sediments. And because of this, marine sediments can really help us uh, help guide interpretations of what's currently happening with our climate, what's happened in the past, and what we need to prepare for in the future. So I really think of biogeochemistry as a tool that we can use uh, to look at different processes over really broad spatial and temporal scales. So in marine sediments, this includes things on very short and small time scales, like mineral water uh, and organic interactions, biomineralization, uh, microbial activity, uh, up to uh, community and ecosystem dynamics and sedimentary budgets, which are also strongly linked to uh, marine uh, sediment biogeochemistry, and then all the way up to global scale and long-term processes like climate change and ocean acidification. 
Uh, and I would say as biogeochemists, we're really good at looking at these individual processes, um, but we need to do a better job of building connections between them, both through space and time. And because our science is never happening in a vacuum, we also need to do a better job of connecting uh, these processes to the human dimension. So uh, in order to build these connections, I have really uh, centered my research program around uh, some of these broad research questions I'll be uh, talking about today. So first, what controls early biogenetic processes in marine carbonate sediments? How will changing ocean conditions impact shallow marine carbonate budgets? And is carbon storage in coastal marine sediments a viable climate mitigation strategy? And so I'll address uh, these questions through uh, four different themes. Uh, so first, we'll look at diagenetic controls in modern carbonate sediments. And then we'll sort of scale out and look at dissolution uh, and shallow marine carbonate budgets. Then we'll talk about carbon cycling and storage in coastal marine sediments. And then deeply interwoven with this work uh, for me and my research program uh, is building community-led partnerships that can uh, build coastal climate resiliency. So uh, these icons will be along the top corner of the top to help guide us. And with that, we'll uh, jump right into it. So uh, we can't really talk about uh, marine uh, carbonates or marine sediments without first talking about biomineralization. So uh, biomineralization is the formation of minerals by organisms uh, and because the organism is forming the mineral it can have that process can have a very large impact on the geochemistry of the minerals and uh, biominerals are made up of uh, different mineral classes so we have our uh, silica based organisms over there on the left uh, we have phosphate, such as fish bones and fish teeth. We have uh, nacre, which is what gives abalone shells uh, their beautiful color, and pearls, their sheen, um, which is carbonate-based. And speaking of carbonates, uh, carbonate minerals are the most uh, abundant and widespread uh, biogenic mineral in the ocean. And all of the organisms that are pictured here make some form of calcium carbonate mineral as their uh, protective and skeletal hard part. So everything from these tiny little plankton up to lots of shellfish that we enjoy uh, eating and growing even here along uh, the coast of California. And then all the way up to foundational species such as corals, which uh, support some of the most biodiverse ecosystems on the planet. <laughs> so, uh, carbonate exists in various forms within uh, the ocean. So, uh, these are the most common carbonate polymorphs here. So, uh, all calcium carbonate, but they come in different flavors. Um, so, we have calcite, aragonite, and then sometimes we can have magnesium substitute into the calcite structure, uh, forming magnesium calcite. And these uh, SEM images here at the bottom are showing just how different uh, the physical, the morphology of these different uh, carbonate minerals can be. So calcite on the left, uh, followed by aragonite, uh, amorphous calcium carbonate, and then the much less abundant uh, batterite. So um, like most minerals, uh, biogenic carbonates can have a significant physical and chemical differences between the biogenic forms and the abiotic forms. And some of these differences include uh, generally more complex surfaces. Uh, biogenic minerals also have higher absorption rates. Uh, just like your bones, they tend to have an organic matrix that's associated with the hard mineral structure. And because of that matrix, they tend to be less crystalline. And that also means that they're more readily available to incorporate different elements uh, into their structures. So this figure here is just showing uh, the, uh, on the left we have, no, sorry, on the top we have uh, biotic uh, carbonates and then on the bottom we have abiotic. So you can see they just have a like kind of a fluffier, rougher texture to them on top as opposed to those smoother, more crystalline surfaces on the bottom. 
And because of these differences in their surfaces, they're going to have really different geochemical behaviors as well. It's going to influence how the mineral interacts with surrounding water, organics, uh, and other things in the natural environment. So shallow carbonates, uh, excuse me, carbonates accumulate all around the ocean, right? Um, but it's been shown that 50% of carbonate accumulation actually happens in shallow marine environments. And in fact, that over 70% of the carbonates that we see preserved in the rock record are actually these shallow, were once these shallow carbonates. And so what that means is that a lot of the paleo-oceanographic and paleoclimatic inferences that we're making in the geologic record are based on shallow carbonates. And in order to make those inferences, oftentimes we have to make the assumption that there's little or no diagenetic alteration after the sediments have uh, been deposited. And this assumption might be true in deeper, more homogeneous uh, deep sea sediments, but in shallow carbonates, we know that there are a lot of processes that are happening as soon as the carbonates are deposited that are going to uh, alter the surrounding minerals. So uh, the biggest example of this is we know that in shallow carbonates, we have daily cycles of photosynthesis and respiration, which are taking up and releasing CO2, and therefore driving calcium carbonate precipitation and dissolution. Um, typically, we have photosynthesis uh, and precipitation during the day, and we have respiration and dissolution occurring at night. All right, I've heard that you lose half your audience once you show a chemical equation, but <laughs> I'm a geochemist, so sorry. <laughs> um, so just a little refresher, maybe, hopefully, on uh, carbonate chemistry. If you've never seen this before, that's okay. So there are two main parameters that we use to uh, constrain the carbonate chemistry of the ocean. So the first one is dissolved inorganic carbon. And just like it sounds, it's the amount of inorganic carbon that's dissolved in seawater. And that carbon exists in different species, and I've highlighted where the carbon is in all of the ones listed here. The other one is a little trickier. Um, it's known as total alkalinity. And this is essentially a solution's ability to neutralize acid. Uh, and that acid neutralization capacity comes from uh, the major uh, anions in seawater, the main ones that I've uh, listed here. So um, the reason I'm bringing up the ICMTA is that we can actually infer uh, the amount of photosynthesis and respiration and precipitation and dissolution happening within the sediments because as those processes happen, they actually create a gradient of dissolved inorganic carbon and total alkalinity between the sediment and the water. And so what we can do is we can measure those fluxes and that can tell us something about what's happening inside of the sediments. So this approach is really very widely used in my field, um, but it does have certain limitations. Uh, the biggest limitation that I think it has is that we talked about how there's different versions of uh, carbonate minerals. If we measure just DIC and alkalinity, we can't tell these three different polymorphs apart. And that's because if any of these precipitate or dissolve, they change DIC and alkalinity in the same way. So we don't know what minerals are actually participating in the reactions, even though we can measure the reactions um, additionally, DIC and TA can be influenced by a lot of other geochemical processes, so not just carbonate dynamics, so redox dynamics, groundwater input, uh, and even certain organic acid-based systems. So um, these limitations make it really difficult to answer some of the outstanding questions in my field. Um, so for example, which carbonate mineral phases are precipitating or dissolving. This is important to think about when we think about different organisms that maybe make uh, their tests and their shells out of different carbonate polymorphs. And also, what controls the likelihood of them dissolving, uh, which is a term also known as apparent solubility. 
So using a wide range of both uh, laboratory and field uh, techniques and experimental approaches, uh, I tried to find answers uh, to some of these unresolved questions. And the first tool I want to share with you is uh, looking at trace elements and carbonates. So uh, because of their different uh, crystal structures, uh, carbonates incorporate things like magnesium and strontium in different ratios. So magnesium uh, tends to prefer the calcitic structure, whereas strontium prefers the aragonitic structure. Um, and so what we can do is we can actually measure the ratios of magnesium, strontium, and calcium both in our sediments and in the overlying water to start getting at this question of which mineral phases are participating in the different reactions. And so I'm not going to get too into this for the sake of time, um, but using this method we were able to show that we can use both total alkalinity and calcium measurements to get a better uh, idea of the net precipitation or net calcification across an entire uh, carbonate platform. Uh, so this work was done in the Bahamas, uh, and we essentially showed that over a two-year time series that the calcium measurements are uh, really tightly linked with the alkalinity measurements, which shows that we can use this as an additional uh, proxy. Um, so if you're interested in that work, it was published in Marine Chem. <coughs> Not my favorite paper, but if you want to check it out, <laughs> it's a little bit of a dense read, but if you have questions, you can always reach out to me. Um, but why am I talking about this in relation to geology? Well, uh, trace elements like magnesium and strontium are often used as paleo proxies, right? We go into the rock record, we look at carbonates, we measure these trace elements, and then we make certain assumptions. This figure here is from a recent review paper that essentially shows how susceptible different geochemical proxies are to diagenetic alteration. And what I want you to see here, do I have a laser on this? No. No? Okay. <laughs> I just kept pressing a button hoping for a laser. <laughs> um, so what I want you to focus on, I know it's a very busy figure, but essentially um, it shows the different proxies here in the middle uh, arc. Strontium and magnesium are here, and the, uh, the size of these arrows tells you how susceptible each uh, type of proxy is to diagenetic alteration. And you can see that the arrow coming from strontium and magnesium is one of the biggest arrows here, which means that it's one of the more susceptible proxies to diagenetic alteration. So how can we get at this question of, is, are the signals that we're looking at in the geologic record primary or diagenetic? Well, what we can do is we can, again, measure these ratios both in the sediments and the fluxes of these ratios coming in and out of the sediments, and that can tell us how these ratios are changing between each of the systems over time. So let's move on to our second question for the sake of time. But um, how about this question of how likely are these different minerals uh, to dissolve? Again, also known as their apparent solubility. Well, when we look at abiotic minerals, we typically just think of their apparent solubility or their solubility as just a thermodynamic constraint. Right? It's just math, chemistry, pressure, temperature, right? And that holds true for most abiotic carbonates. However, when we look at biogenic carbonates, we know that they have those different surfaces, those different mineralogies, uh, and different histories that might make their uh, susceptibility to dissolving different. Uh, in fact, uh, previous studies have shown that things like microarchitecture, which is just how complex the surface is, grain size, uh, those types of things can actually override the mineral uh, stability of a carbonate. And this makes sense when you kind of look at different forms of carbonate. So up here, sorry, I keep forgetting a couple of these here. Um, <laughs> so up here we have classic isolated spar. Here we have some that make their, their little shells out of uh, calcium carbonate. And here we have some shallow carbonate sediments. And you can see that, yeah, I could probably determine how this dissolves, but look how messy this is. There's a bunch of different carbonates here. They were created by different organisms. 
They've gone through different erosional histories, and so this is messy, really, really messy. That's all I want you to know from this slide. Okay, and this heterogeneity or this, this messiness of shallow carbonates is reflected even at the micro scale. So these are two SEM images of two grains from the same shallow carbonate sample. You can see on the left I have this little forum, and on the right, I just love this picture, cute little gastropod. All right, so these are these are tiny for scale of 100 microns right here, okay? So you can imagine that if I did a dissolution experiment on a bunch of carbonates and I have a grain like this next to a grain like that, they're probably gonna behave very differently, right? So how can we then scale uh, scale these questions about how these systems are operating up to uh, larger than the micro scale? Well, um, it's a difficult thing to do, uh, but regardless, going into it, we can expect uh, that carbonate mineral dissolution will increase with increasing PCO2 or decreasing pH, decreasing grain size because we have a higher surface area to volume ratio, and decreasing mineral stability. However, I wanted to explicitly test these paradigms specifically in shallow carbonates. So to do this, I measured uh, the dissolution rates of very well characterized carbonate sediments from both the Bermuda carbonate platform and the Heron Island platform in Australia. And uh, to do this, I used this controlled uh, laboratory batch reactor. Um, if you want to know more about it, I spent a lot of time with that system, <laughs> so happy to answer any questions. Um, but the results of these experiments are here. Um, I do want to mention that uh, I have three undergraduates helping me with this work, um, who are now all PhD students, actually. Um, so Morgan Goodrich, Sam Kikleva, who's pictured on top, and Ralph Torres, who's there uh, below him. So the results of these experiments are plotted with uh, PCO2 along the x-axis and the dissolution rate on the y-axis. And as you can see, as we increase PCO2 or decrease pH, we're increasing our dissolution rate in all of our samples. So that first paradigm checks out. What's interesting though, is that I found no relationship between decreasing grain size or decreasing mineral stability in these experiments. So these two paradigms, we can start to question. In fact, of all of the characteristics that I analyzed the samples for, the only relationship that I found with dissolution rate was actually higher dissolution with decreasing organic content and higher dissolution with decreasing delta 13C of that organic content. So, why would that be weird, right? I did these experiments when I was a very junior scientist and I thought I had mislabeled something, or I don't know. But it turns out it's real, I redid the experiments. <laughs> um, and so I had to start thinking about what would be driving these relationships. Well, we can start to think about this in a little bit of a different way by considering the actual morphology of these biogenic carbonates. So I mentioned earlier that biogenic minerals tend to have an organic matrix associated with them. And we refer to that uh, internal uh, organic matter as intracrystalline organic matter. But um, biogenic carbonates are known to readily absorb organic material to their surfaces as well. And so we refer to that as non-intracrystalline organic matter. And so if we, it's, it's been previously suggested that these organic coatings that absorb onto the surface actually act as a protective barrier between the carbonate grain and the surrounding seawater, which naturally is going to change how it interacts uh, geochemically with its surroundings. So if we want to test that hypothesis, what we need to do is remove the uh, absorbed organics without damaging the uh, crystal surface or um, the intracrystalline organic matter. And we can easily do this by oxidizing that uh, surface layer uh, which removes that organic coating without damaging any of the other parts of the grain. And sure enough, when we did that, uh, we saw that the uh, oxidized or bleached samples, uh, which are here on the uh, 
uh, the dashed lines here, uh, that for both a high organic content and a low organic content sample, that the dissolution rates increased by two to three times when we removed those organic coatings. So this can explain why we see mineral dissolution increasing when we decrease that organic content. Because when we remove those coatings, we're decreasing the total amount of organic uh, carbon on, on the grains. Um, but what about this isotopic one? This one's a little messier. So um, once I determine the isotopic signature of the intracrystalline organic matrix and the non-intracrystalline organic matrix, this pattern started to make sense. Because you can imagine that as we remove this heavier uh, non-intracrystalline organic matter, we're going to start to reflect the isotopic signature of the intracrystalline matrix. So what does this look like in data? I tried to put a lot of animations because I know it's a lot. <laughs> um, so this graph is, uh, you can just think of it as increasing uh, dissolution rate. And then on the y-axis, we have uh, organic content. Uh, and in purple over here, we have the delta-13 uh, C signature of that organic content. So now uh, we can imagine, keep an eye on my little grain at the top, that as we start to remove that absorbed organic material, we're decreasing our total organic content. And as we remove it, we're also lightening our uh, isotopic signature. And now that protective coating is gone. And so we're also increasing our dissolution rate. And so we see this pattern across both of these global uh, carbonate platforms, but there's still a lot of questions uh, left to answer. But for now, we have a, a working hypothesis that uh, suggests that biogenic carbonate dissolution rates are, uh, uh, that they decrease in the presence of organic matter coatings on the surface of the grains, because again, those mineral surfaces are unable to directly interact with surrounding sea Okay, like who cares, right? <laughs> well, this challenges these really long held assumptions about carbonate cycling. And the carbonate cycle is intimately linked with our global carbon cycle. And so if this uh, pattern is ubiquitous in different environments in the global ocean, you can imagine how that would have a somewhat cascading effect on how we interpret uh, carbonate cycling in the global ocean. All right. So, moving forward here, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the solution. It's kind of my favorite thing if you haven't uh, figured that out yet. Um, so, uh, I do a lot of work in coral reef systems because that's where the best carbonates are. Um, and coral reef scientists tend to come from a more biologic background. I'm trying not to say anything too uh, <laughs> inflammatory of being recorded. Uh, and they tend to measure the health of a reef based on uh, a term we call net community calcification, or NCC. So net community calcification is just the balance of gross calcification by organisms or in situ precipitation uh, with gross dissolution removed. Um, this uh, framing of coral reef health, though, really isn't a geologic perspective. It's more of a biological view because there's a lot of geochemical processes that are happening that aren't really being accounted for. So if you want to take more of a geological view, we can think about this as carbonate accumulation on a platform. And we have all of these various inputs. So again, calcification by organisms, abiotic precipitation or cementation, and also import from off the platform, uh, import from other environments. Uh, and then we have outputs, which include geochemical dissolution, export off of the platform, as well as bioerosion by organisms. And unfortunately, because of what we are doing to the global ocean, uh, it's anticipated that all of these inputs will decrease over time, and all of these outputs will increase. 
So you can imagine, just like my bank account, if you pull too much out and you're not putting enough in, eventually you're gonna, you're gonna go in the red, right? And so this means that potentially we're looking at a shift in coral ecosystems where they are no longer accumulating carbonate and they're actually losing carbonate. So uh, a lot of work has been done in this space in, uh, in relation to organisms, but uh, again, that's a very biological perspective. If we think about carbonate accumulation as the whole platform system, there's a lot of sediment on coral reefs, right? So about 95% of the volume of carbonate that's on a coral reef system is actually the sediments, which are made up of eroded uh, biogenic calcified uh, calcified minerals. Um, so I went to go uh, study the, uh, the sedimentary processes uh, at Lizard Island, Australia. Terrible place to work. It just <laughs> hurt my eyes. <laughs> um, but you can see that you know we have really classic reef structures here. So um, we have a, a coral lagoon, but it's surrounded by just a huge amount of sediment. And so if we want to think of a reef more holistically, we have to think about what's happening with the carbonate sediments and not just with the calcifying organisms. Um, so I mentioned earlier, one of the ways that we can look at changes in the sediments and the processes that are happening is that we can measure the fluxes of dissolved inorganic carbon and total alkalinity. And from those measurements, we can then infer uh, you know, what biogeochemical processes are happening in the sedimentary system. Um, so one method I use to do this uh, is uh, measuring these fluxes using benthic incubation chambers, part of my diet partner. Um, <laughs> but this is me on scuba, uh, and you can see I'm uh, sampling these chambers that we've deployed into the field. And these chambers have little uh, openings at the top, so we can go down on scuba, we can take our syringes and we can pull samples from uh, the chamber to get uh, at those fluxes. These little tubes sticking out are pour water wells, so we can also go in and take uh, geochemical measurements from depth within the sediments. And uh, the really cool thing is that those ports on the top of the chambers we can actually inject different treatments to mimic different overlying water column conditions. So if we're interested in something like how has how have these sedimentary processes changed with changing climate, we can do something like acidify them, right? To see what's going to happen under future ocean acidification scenarios. We can also do the opposite. We can add alkalinity to it to mimic pre-industrial conditions. And so that's exactly what we did. Uh, we conducted these experiments at uh, four different locations around the island with different, uh, with different sedimentary conditions. And we measured net community calcification, which again is just the balance of precipitation and dissolution. And we also measured net community production, which is the balance of photosynthesis, uh, well, primary production and respiration. So these experiments were all run for a full day, um, and they were sampled every 12 hours, so dusk, dawn, dusk, and that allowed us to get both the daytime rates and the nighttime rates, as well as the integrated rates over a full day. And we really wanted to cover a wide range of overlying water conditions, so we used those ports uh, to inject high alkalinity water to mimic past conditions in the ocean, and high PCO2 or low pH water to mimic future conditions on the reef. All right, this is about to be a lot of data, so I'm gonna orient you all first. All right, so on the left side here, we have our net community uh, production rates. Oops, did I just pull that? I pulled the plug. Um, <laughs> so on the left side, we have our net community production rates. On the right side, we have our net community, oh, there we go. We have our net community calcification rates. Um, each treatment is uh, binned uh, by color, so the acidified is red, the control is green, and alkalinity is per or the past conditions are purple. And then uh, all of the sites are along the x axis, x axis there. Uh, in the top uh, panels, the nighttime rates are shown with this 
somewhat transparent color, not showing up super great. Uh, and the daytime rates are shown with the, with the opaque colors. And then in the bottom panels, it's just the integrated rate over 24 hours. Okay, deep breath. <laughs> All right, so let's start with the net community production rates. So what's really cool about the net community production rates is that we see no significant difference across treatments. At any of the sites, day, night, 24 hours, they're all the same. So that suggests that photosynthesis and respiration are really not influenced by changes in overlying uh, carbonate chemistry of the seawater. The net community calcification rates, though, tell a very different story. So, um, oops, sorry. so starting with the nighttime rates, what we see is that they're different across all treatments. Okay, so every site, they're significantly uh, different across the CO2 control and alkalinity uh, treatments. However, during the day, we didn't see a significant difference between the acidified and the control treatments. A little bizarre, right? If we look at the 24 hour rates, oh, sorry. So, what could be driving this? It means that something's happening during the day that's not happening at night. So one suggestion is that we have biological calcification happening during the day. And it's been shown that a lot of marine organisms are capable of modifying the geochemistry near their calcification sites, uh, even though the surrounding waters are not, uh, are not you know, conducive to calcification. However, at night, it's just ge geochemical dissolution, right? There's no organismal process that's happening at night, and so the sediments are just subject to changes in geochemistry. And then what's really interesting is that over the 24 hour rates, those nighttime differences between calcification and dissolution uh, in the acidified and control treatments uh, actually push the 24 hour rates into net dissolving. So below this line, we see that the sediments are dissolving under CO2 conditions over a full day. What does this mean? That means that we have net loss of sediments, right? We're losing sediments under future acidified conditions. And so um, another thing that this, so it means that this net dilution, dissolution at night is primarily responsible for this transition from net calcifying to net dissolving uh, within the sedimentary system. It also means, this is being recorded, but it's okay, all the biologists in my field have already heard me say this, uh, dissolution may be more sensitive to changes in ocean carbonate chemistry than biological calcification. And so if we really wanna study these systems, we have to think about both sides of the points, not just how the organism's uh, calcification will respond, but how uh, the minerals will respond once they've precipitated. And so if we put this in the broader context, we expect dissolution to increase, that's an output, and again, this could be driving our systems and shifting them into a state of net erosion or net loss. Um, there have been a few studies that have shown that at the reef system, that uh, if we reverse ocean acidification or alkalinization, it enhances reef calcification, and if we acidify them, that it suppresses net community calcification. Both of these studies, though, suggested that the signal they were seeing was actually coming from the sediments and not from the corals themselves. And I think that um, this work really, you know, supports that theory that um, these ecosystem scale changes are happening because of these changes in the sediments and not because of changes uh, in the corals. Um, also, just a quick mention, this is my pitch for you all to get into carbon stuff. <laughs> um, there has been an explosion of marine carbon dioxide removal techniques. Um, what I want to say is that, uh, you know, I definitely have really big feelings about anything geoengineering wise, uh, you know, changing our ecosystems, things like that. This is happening with or without us. It's happening with or without geologists. There's already a ton of startup companies out there doing these exper experiments, modifying our global ocean. And so I think as scientists, uh, if this is something you're interested in, I think 
you know, we really have a part to play in making sure that the future of carbon capture in the ocean is informed and responsible. Um, so one of the uh, areas that I've been working in, on is uh, alkalinity enhancement. So if we put more alkalinity into the ocean, the ocean can hold more carbon. So what a lot of folks don't know is that 30% um, of the emissions that we put into the atmosphere every year actually go into the ocean, right? And so the ocean has a huge capacity to store carbon, and essentially all of these methods are trying to capitalize uh, on the efficiency of these different methods for capturing carbon. Alkalinity enhancement I have big feelings about. <laughs> um, I think there are a few viable methods, but the one that I'm more interested in is why don't, why don't we just look at the systems that already work really well, right? Why don't we look at the systems that are already storing and sequestering huge amounts of carbon? And so um, the coastal ocean is really good at this. The coastal ocean is, is one of the main places that carbon is stored in the global ocean. And so um, I want to take this last part just to look towards the future and discuss uh, how uh, carbon cycling and storage in uh, coastal marine sediments might be a potential climate mitigation strategy. So the reason folks don't want to do stuff in the coastal ocean is because carbon dynamics in the coastal ocean are a hot mess. There are so many processes that are happening that distribute and transform carbon uh, in the coastal ocean. Uh, and there are physical processes, uh, there's riverine input, there's biological activity, um, and understanding how carbon moves through the coastal ocean is really important because it's the main connection between the terrestrial carbon cycle and the oceanic carbon cycle. So one area, I'm biased, but one area that needs a lot better understanding is the exchange of carbon between coastal sediments and the overlying seawater. And these coastal systems get really messy because unlike the sediments we were looking at before, um, they're not just carbonates, right? And in those systems, there's a lot of different biogeochemical processes that can change dissolved inorganic carbon and total alkalinity in very similar or even identical ways. So that kind of obscures our ability to get at the, uh, to parse apart the different biogeochemical uh, processes. Um, but typically, we still think of these sedimentary systems as photosynthesis and respiration, calcium carbonate, dissolution and precipitation, but also a whole suite of redox dynamics that can also contribute dissolved inorganic carbon and total alkalinity to the overlying seawater. And some recent work has suggested that fluxes of inorganic carbon um, out of the coastal ocean might actually be a four times greater sink of carbon than any organic carbon burial in the sediment. Um, so I'm interested in seeing how systems that already store a lot of organic carbon, known as blue carbon systems, contribute inorganic contribute to this inorganic carbon sink as well. Um, I study seagrasses in this context because if you look at this uh, map of all the different blue carbon ecosystems, so seagrasses, salt marshes, mangroves, the green is seagrass, and you can see that they have a really broad latitudinal range. And because of this broad latitudinal range, they're one of the best blue carbon ecosystems. They store a ton of organic carbon relative to their uh, global coverage. Um, and because of this range, uh, seagrasses can grow in very different sedimentary environments. Uh, and they influence the sediments in different ways. So the sediments themselves can have different properties. But seagrasses can also help trap carbon uh, and bury it. There's also, uh, they also uh, decrease resuspension of sediments. They deliver oxygen to the sediments. Uh, they even enhance microbial activity. And this leads to different fluxes, again, of that dissolved inorganic carbon and total alkalinity across uh, the sediment interface. So um, I'm particularly interested in how total alkalinity 
uh, is produced and flexed out of these sediments because again, alkalinity increases the ocean's ability to take up carbon. So if these systems are not only burying organic carbon, but while they do that, flexing additional alkalinity to the coastal ocean, then we're getting a lot of bang for our buck, right? And hopefully we can convince people that preserving, protecting, and potentially restoring these types of ecosystems will not only benefit carbon capture, but also provide all of the ecosystem benefits uh, that come along with these coastal environments. Um, so this has already been studied you know, a lot in terms of seagrass metabolism and seagrass being able to take up carbon dioxide through photosynthesis, as well as through air-sea gas exchange, but there hasn't been as much work done on the sedimentary fluxes within seagrass systems. And again, I think that it's important to study this because a lot of those papers that I showed you earlier, uh, they measure the fluxes out of the whole system, but they don't know where it's coming from or what biogeochemical processes are responsible for it. And a lot of times they're just like, oh, it's coming from the sediments. But like, <laughs> they don't measure it, they don't look at it, they don't know what's actually happening. So if we can constrain those exchanges, we can have a better idea of how much is being exported out into the open ocean and what the actual carbon sink for these systems is. So um, I'm gonna skip ahead here a little bit. I think we're getting a little short on time. So um, <coughs> lastly, I just wanted to talk about uh, some of the community-led partnerships uh, that I uh, had the privilege of building uh, regionally uh, in hopes of uh, building coastal climate resiliency in, uh, in different communities. So um, unfortunately, there's often very little overlap between who's doing climate research, who's most impacted by climate change, and who's making policy decisions related to climate. And this mostly has to do with the fact uh, that there's a lack of diversity in the people doing climate research and making policy decisions because of exclusionary practices and systems. And those practices and systems are excluding the very people that we know will be most impacted by climate change, which are black, indigenous communities, communities of color, women, and low-income communities. So I just want to highlight as a geoscientist ways that we can uh, integrate these three spheres more. Um, so I've been lucky enough to work with uh, the AGU Thriving Earth Exchange. If you've never heard of them, check them out. Essentially, they help pair scientists with uh, communities that are looking for scientific expertise. So essentially, you just put your name on a list, you say what your expertise is, and then someone might reach out to you like they did to me uh, and ask you to uh, work with the community on a project. Uh, so this project I'm doing uh, with uh, a group of fly fishermen in the Bahamas, and essentially they want to see what the environmental uh, what the environmental uh, risks are associated with a proposed limestone mine. So I'm really excited to say that the work that we did here uh, convinced, well, not just us, but <laughs> was part of what convinced the Bahamian government to uh, decline the mining proposal, but mining companies are powerful and they have a lot of money and a lot of lawyers, and so we know that they're gonna come back around with a revised proposal um, probably multiple times. So this work is ongoing uh, in that region. Um, another uh, project I did was uh, in San Francisco Bay, um, looking at an old abandoned uh, naval facility called Hunter's Point. Um, and what we did is we mapped <coughs> legacy contaminants in and around the point because there's a community that lives adjacent to uh, the naval facility that's predominantly a community of color um, and it is under-resourced and essentially they have identified uh, just wildly disproportionate uh, health impacts and cancer clusters. And so the community wants to know are these uh, health disparities related to the contaminants that are present on the naval site? So um, we went around and sampled the area uh, and did some independent testing for them. Um, so as 
a research scientist, I also um, recognize that I'm in a uh, position of extreme privilege, uh, and I want to use that privilege to broaden accessibility, uh, inclusion, and partnerships uh, for who's doing climate research. So I don't know if you all have seen this paper, <laughs> um, but if you haven't, check it out. It basically is saying that the geosciences have made essentially no progress in the last four decades in terms of our racial and ethnic diversity. Um, so these are just some statistics. Uh, less than 5% of US geoscience degree holders are women of color, and less than 1% of US geoscience faculty are women of color. But as a woman of color, uh, I don't really need these statistics to tell me that, right? When you're the first, the only in the room, time and time again, it makes you start to question your belonging, right? And whether you're supposed to be where you are. Um, and that's not a good feeling. Nobody wants to feel like that, right? So I decided to, uh, you know, use uh, my position now uh, to essentially, they like to say, hold the door open behind you. I'd like to just rip the door off the hinges. Um, <laughs> so a couple programs that I started to uh, try uh, to broaden participation. Uh, one of them is uh, a diversity fellowship program at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, where I did my PhD. Um, and what it does is it uh, addresses barriers to scientific diving. So diving is a great research tool, but unfortunately it's expensive. And there's also a lot of uh, historical uh, barriers to water access and water sports. And so uh, I'm really excited to say uh, we started our first cohort of fellows last fall, and they're working now towards getting their scientific diving certification as well as um, the equipment, uh, training, and mentorship that they need to be successful. Um, at UC Davis, uh, we just started a uh, program called Pathways to Inclusive Research. Uh, so what this does is it provides opportunities for transfer students transferring into UC Davis to come out to the Bodega Marine Lab the summer before they transfer in to UC Davis so that they can uh, access uh, research and field work opportunities, build relationships with faculty, because when you're a transfer student, I mean two years, that goes by really quick, right? So um, setting, setting students up with that network as soon as they walk in the door, even before they walk in the door, uh, we're hoping will uh, promote uh, success and retention for our transfer students. Why do I do all of this? <laughs> um, well, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Dr. Brandon Jones. Um, he's actually the incoming AGU president, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> um, but he was at NSF, and I've had the pleasure of hearing him talk many times. And he often says, we're facing all hands on deck issues, but not all hands are on deck. And um, I really just you know, included this part of my talk because I just want to encourage everyone to see how you can build connections uh, you know, between your own personal and professional networks so that we can, uh, once again, really broaden who's included in conversations and research and policy making decisions around climate change. Um, and that's because, cheesy as it may sound, the only way we're going to do this is if we do it together, right? Um, if you want to know more about me and my research group, uh, we are the Coastal Health and Nearshore Geochemistry Lab, also known as the Change Lab. Um, I am looking for graduate students, so if you're interested, reach out. Um, and you can find us at ucdchangelab.com. And I always end with a picture of the reason I do this work. She's a little bigger than this now, but I like this picture because she's holding a rock. <laughs> <laughs> And I'll take any questions. <laughs>